Greetings, Clarifiles and Clarifileettes. We're going to have a brief video here today. Uh, I promised a fourth installment of learning how to play French embouchure, and uh, this is the fourth installment. It's actually going to be followed by an actual playing demonstration. I'll talk about that later. But the first thing I have for you is what you might call a double lip checklist. Okay, and it, it should answer some of the questions that some of you have had. So uh, let's go with the list. I've actually written it down here because <clears throat> my memory isn't all that great. I leave things out. So I think I've got most of the things here uh, that are important. Uh, first of all, when you're playing French embouchure, you need to always play well-balanced reeds in practice as well as performance. And you know the ramifications of that, of course. Uh, you have to learn how to balance reeds. Don't play on unbalanced reeds. They will ruin your playing and cause you to develop habits behind your nose that you shouldn't have to do if your equipment is actually really efficient. Make sure you place the reed and adjust it on the mouthpiece for optimum results in tone and response. Just because you previously balanced the reed doesn't mean uh, that it's going to play as soon as you just put it on the mouthpiece. It doesn't obviate the need to, for careful placement of the reed on the mouthpiece to get the optimum even and balanced response. And basically what you use are you use the same tools to test the reed playing on the mouthpiece with its proper placement up and down and side to side with its proper placement that you would do when you're actually balancing the reed. So the testing process for, for optimum placement is the same as the testing process for balancing the reed. Let your right hand thumb do most of the work by lifting and maintaining, you know, a, a firm seal of the mouthpiece reed wedge against the lips. The lips are just firm and uh, they're a fixed aperture. They're never closing on the mouthpiece and reed. The only time you would need to close on the mouthpiece and reed is if you're playing a badly balanced reed and the reed doesn't speak, doesn't respond well, or the sound is not clear because of the imbalance and then you have to crunch down. But if you've observed number one, which is playing well-balanced reeds, that shouldn't be an issue. So then your thumb lifting slightly and gently uh, with the reed wedge, you're going to get your sound. Your sound should speak right off. You shouldn't have to squeeze or do anything ordinary in, uh, unordinary behind your nose to get things to go. Okay. Number four, don't try to be a hero or macho guy or gal, or gal. Rest the clarinet. I rest my clarinet on my knees most of the time, and that doesn't mean that the full weight of the clarinet is on the knees, okay? The, the knees basically help stabilize the clarinet, um, and, but there is enough weight off the knees so that the thumb is able to lift and maintain that that gentle snugness that you need to seal everything off and use the air to make this make the reed speak. So yes, go ahead, rest the clarinet on your knees. Don't try to say, well, I stand and then you're messing yourself up and cutting yourself and then you can't play for several days because it's too painful. And then you give up and go into insurance or something. I don't know. But yeah, don't try to stand and play and not until you've been playing a long time. Even somebody like Harold Wright, who played French embouchure all his professional life, he didn't stand and play very long. He, Every time I saw him perform, whether it was with a concerto or, or whether it was with a, a chamber music group, he always sat. I saw him sit, play the Mozart clarinet concerto in uh, Symphony Hall in Boston, and he sat and read it. You've got to... Do the things that you need to do to get the best results from your performance. So don't try to be a hero or a macho guy or gal. Rest the clarinet. Don't try to stand and play until 
after your playing mechanics and your reed finishing are rock solid, and even then for li limited periods of time. So that's number four. Never hurt yourself. If you're hurting your lips, you're doing something wrong. Figure out what it is and stop it. Rest frequently, especially in the early stages of French embouchure playing. But look, these are muscles that you're developing, not to squeeze, but just to be firm and, and hold things in place. Now, that may not sound difficult, but just think, if someone asks you just to hold your arm out, eventually, just holding your arm out for a short period of time, you will begin to feel the weight of the arm on the muscles, and it would be very, very hard to keep your arm out for a long time. So just holding a muscle in place, you know, that puts a lot of stress on the muscle. So when you're just being firm in the lips so that you have a firm cushion for the reed mouthpiece wedge to snug against, that doesn't mean that's, that's nothing. That's quite a bit. So give the muscle a time to repair, rest, and the muscles very quickly repair themselves. And you got to remember, you know, most solos that you get in orchestra, they're only a few seconds long. So you're not going to have to sit there and play for an hour solid. Don't do that. Don't overdo it. Don't cut your lips. Don't get in pain. Okay, so rest frequently. That's number five. Number six on our list, if your teeth are sharp, use some kind of cushioning. You're not going to bite, I promise you. I recommend parchment paper. Parchment paper is, I've got a whole video on parchment paper. It's really super durable stuff. It lasts forever. I, I make uh, my upper teeth are a little long for my upper lip. I had to stretch my upper lip a little bit to play double lip originally. And uh, this is a piece of parchment paper. And uh, I use that to cover my teeth now because they've gotten from old age, I guess, so sharp that it's uh, really, uh, they're like razors on the edge and I don't want to take the, get the dentist to take them off anymore. So uh, I use the parchment paper and it works fine. Once you get used to the snugging method, believe me, you're not going to bite. So uh, get something if you need it on your lower teeth. But uh, so it's very important. Parchment paper is the least expensive thing that I know, and it works really great. Just a little experimenting on how, how thick you want to put the parchment paper and all that. And you're good to go. Uh, something like this, uh, something like this, it's going to last for months. So... Uh, and you can make several of them. I sterilize them uh, occasionally, and uh, they, they're just dandy. All right, so remember, no jaw closure. You drop the jaw slightly to create the opening, the aperture, and then bring the horn to the face. Never bring the face to the horn. If you're having to bring the face to the horn, that means there's something wrong something wrong usually with the reed balance because the reed should speak very easily without closure. That's it. The sound has to really be there. So that's number seven. No jaw closure. Once you drop and create that opening, that's it. The jaw never closes. If you feel like you need a little bit more control on the reed, then just snug and lift gently just slightly more. And that should give you what you need. And if you're having to really snug really hard, again, you probably, there's something wrong with your reed mouthpiece mismatch, something wrong with your reed balance. You might need a little bit more for the high register when you get above high C, but that's another video. And this you may consider controversial, but I assure you it's correct. Don't think you must take a large amount of mouthpiece in your mouth, large amount of reed in your mouth. That is just hitting the head stupid. It's a bogus idea. You can get just as much sound uh, with a small amount of reed in your mouth then you pass and pass the inside of your lower lips than you can with a large amount. And actually, the sound is better 
you have more control over it, and the quality of the sound is so much better. Plus, it will help seriously eliminating some of those grunts and undertones that so many of you get when you're playing in the upper clarion notes, like G, A, B, C. It's very easy to grunt, get undertone out of those notes. Uh, and usually, your reeds are unbalanced, you're biting too hard, and or you're taking too little reed or too much reed in your mouth, so you don't have any control over the soft attacks and wide leaps and stuff that go into that upper upper clarion register. That's a, you know, one of the secrets to it, well, there's a combination, but your air has to be right, your tongue position and voicing has to be right, and you have to, and you can't be taking a lot of mouthpiece read in your mouth and get the control that you need, especially in long slurs in the upper clarion, to the upper clarion, or from the altissimo to the upper clarion. So uh, experiment with that. You'll find that if your read is really well balanced, then your read has to be well balanced to do this, uh, and properly balanced tip to back as well as side to side. When, when you do this, check and experiment around and find a proper amount of read, again, past your lower lip, tip of the mouthpiece, tip of the reed, you'll find you you play so much better if you do that rather than thinking, I've got to get a lot of reed in my mouth in order to get a lot of sound. You don't do that. So don't think you must take a large amount of mouthpiece into the mouth. It's a bogus idea. You can get just as much volume uh, with uh, of tone with less reed with the added benefit of more control and fewer problems with grunts and undertoning. For the very highest tones, that is up in the screech, screech register, snug a slight bit more mouthpiece in your mouth if you have to. With some reeds, they'll be so well balanced side to side and tip to back, you won't have to do that. The third register will just go seamlessly out. But every once in a while, especially if you're playing in the softer dynamics, you may have to, to just lift a little bit more. But it's just a little bit. And you have to, you know, don't go medieval on this stuff. You start with a little and just see what the limits are. You have to develop a sensitivity to to uh, get control of the nuances and stuff that make your playing really efficient and really controlled. I, I really got criticized on this when I first started playing French embouchure, uh, Mr. Opperman really, uh, in the most indelicate way, gave me a, rendered a criticism on my playing. And it was about this. Stop slamming and banging with your finger technique. See if you can rise above the Cro-Magnon tendencies and learn to play with some refinement. Okay? You don't want to be slamming and banging. You want to practice a refined finger technique. French embouchure will, you know, kind of, it's kind of built into French embouchure to kind of force you and to stop playing like a pig with your fingers. All right, so many people slam and bang. Very crude techniques. I have videos on that if you look in the archives. There, there are some special fingerings that you can use on the clarinet. That's actually benefit for every, beneficial for every clarinet player, but particularly it's beneficial for double lip players. So I'm going to do a separate video on special fingerings that can, you can use that are going to, number one, help you get control of uh, difficult areas or areas you've traditionally been kind of afraid of, want to back off on, um, and also special fingerings that will, are going to give you uh, a little more facility and a little more smoothness uh, in phrasing and all that. But that's coming up. That's coming up. And I also want to make an announcement that uh, this related to the things I've said about you have to to feel what a correct setup actually is. And then you can learn to play efficiently. Someone has to give you or you have to learn to create it. Someone has to give you or you have to learn to create it an efficient playing setup that doesn't require you to bite or do the dumb things uh, that you have to do in order to play poorly balanced, 
poorly matched reed mouthpiece combinations. So it's not going to be but for a couple months. But what I'm going to do is I what I plan to do is I plan to to create a combination of uh, let's see if I can find this of uh, our homage mouthpiece, which is made in honor of Harold Wright, and I'm going to finish three reeds. So when you purchase the homage mouthpiece, what's going to happen is you're going to get three reeds that I've set up to easily and efficiently play on that mouthpiece and play so you can play it with French embouchure and you can conform to a lot of the things that I've mentioned in this list. But uh, we're not going to be ready to produce that until about two months. And uh, reed production is going to be very, very limited. <clears throat> the reeds going to be reeds are going to be tested, hand balanced, and sterilized, and you will get an efficient playing setup. And most of the people that are making mouthpieces, they just they give you a mouthpiece. Maybe they sell reeds. Other companies they'll say mouthpiece and reeds, but they don't give you a custom setup to do the very thing that you're hoping to do. So if you want to learn to play French embouchure and you want to get the best results out of it, I'm going to try to provide that for you. And then after that, on a limited basis, I'll be able to provide some reads for you because the quality control on the reads are going to be extremely high. We'll have control models and everything for all the testing. So the uniformity of the response and playability of the read is going to be really higher than you imagined it could possibly be. But again, that's going to be a few months off. Okay, that's it. With that, I'm going to bid you uh, au revoir. And uh, until I see you the next time in the video where we're going to be talking about special fingerings for French embouchure. And then after that, we're going to be done with that. And I'm going to try to create a special uh, uh, playlist on YouTube so you can systematically go through through these uh, videos on French embouchure playing and all the uh, related information at your pleasure anytime you want and it's all going to be free and I hope it really helps you a whole lot and as usual that's my story I'm sticking to it try to stick to yours okay yeah good luck with that